All right, so as a special treat today, we are privileged now to be joined by Jim O'Connor, one of the most prominent geologists you'll ever run across who has studied this subject. He's published extensively. Um, Jim, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got yourself into this career involving paleo floods. Oh, well, thanks, Craig. Yeah, I'm I'm a geologist. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey in Portland, Oregon, and um, I've been working for the survey for nearly 35 years now and a big part of my work over the over the decades and even in school before joining the survey was thinking about floods and landscapes and in particular how large floods affect landscapes both short term and long term and of course also interested in the role that floods play in creating geologic hazards so that's been a, a large focus for much of my career. Excellent. Well, Chris and I did a previous webinar uh, covering big floods. And uh, while we, when we did that webinar, we started compiling resources. And you can see these ones here. It's at uh, hydroschool.org slash GLOF. And this doesn't cover just the GLOFs, but a couple of others as well. And when we provided the background information to the attendees for that one, we ran across paper after paper that were all your papers, either co-authored or primary authored by you. These are available to everybody now to download here. And I thought then, um, Chris, as we were talking about some of these things, I'd just pull up some of these papers. And yeah, Chris, um, any questions you wanted to ask about these papers uh, from the author himself? So, Jim, thanks for coming on. And I... I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Uh, I've read a lot of your work. Only recently have I had the privilege of collaborating with you a little bit. But one thing I've never gotten a chance to ask you is what got you into this? What what started it off with big floods? Well, if, if I was going to go way back, it would be when I was five or six years old and my dad built the sandbox um, adjacent <laughs> to, the, to the hose spigot. And so I've been creating natural dams and natural dam failure floods ever since. <laughs> um, but um, more seriously, I'm from Seattle originally, and I did my undergraduate degree at University of Washington and, and got introduced to the Missoula floods there. When it was time to think about going to graduate school, I was encouraged to apply at University of Arizona, where a faculty member there, Vic Baker, had worked on Missoula floods for a long, long time and was very interested in floods and landscapes. So I did both my master's and PhD projects looking at floods and how they affect channels and valley bottoms. And in particular, my PhD thesis was on the Bonneville flood, which is another mm -hmm. large ice age flood like the Missoula floods, but uh, one that was a bit more easier to study from a hydraulic point of view. And this was in the late 80s and these hydraulic models like HEC2. Now, these first sort of step backwater energy balanced flow models were becoming available for more general use by the engineering community. And I saw that as an opportunity to take something from the engineering community and apply it to geologic problems. And that really locked me into a line of research that has continued on until today. Yeah, no, that's great because Chris and I actually had a look at that one on that on that last webinar that uh, that we mentioned. So if you go back and have a look at this one, the number number one nineteen, you'll see an animation of the Bonneville floods <laughs> there. Well, another thing I wanted to mention though is that uh, you've got one here that looks like a river valley, but uh, this one doesn't uh, doesn't even reside on our planet. Uh, tell us a little bit about this one uh, here on, that's on Mars. Yeah, so I haven't been to that flood site yet. Um, <laughs> Maybe um, one day. Yeah, a little site yeah. visit. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Um, I, I personally haven't done a lot of work on floods on other planets, but what's been interesting in terms of thinking about um, floods more generally and how they how they affect landscapes and the different mechanisms that create large floods, it's fascinating to me that you see some of these processes occur on other planets. And floods on Mars, there's quite a research community now that, that's working on those. It, it's fascinating. And it really 
some of that work really came out of working on some of these large ice age floods. And when the first images of Mars became available in the 1970s, the planetary surface patterns looked an awful lot like the channel scablands of, of the Pacific Northwest. And some of this early work in the channel scablands that led directly to this ongoing work on Mars. And and the two fields of study are continuing to feed off each other. It's been it's been fascinating mm. to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Aside from the craters that you see there, it could be the scab lands that we're looking at, you know? One interesting thing is, um, I don't know the details on this. I stumbled across some Martian terrain that was available online, and I don't even know how who put it up on the web, and, and I don't know the background behind it. Obviously, it probably came from NASA, but people are starting to download that. And at the same time, HEC put out a Mars version of Hecraz. And so we were able to actually play around and do some stuff and, you know, some hypothetical natural dam failures quote unquote, but um, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That a funny story. I actually um, attempted to use HEC2 to, to model flows on Mars, but of course I had to go into the code and, and <laughs> um, adjust the gravity um, coefficient yeah. to, to, right. to make it work. And it, it um, you know, I got results that seemed reasonable. Who knows, you know, um, yeah. I'm, very, very tough to verify. <laughs> yeah, yeah and sure. have a look. I think, Chris, you and I have talked about this one here, Rivers on Mars by uh, Grady Hillhouse, who was a guest oh, on, yeah. on your podcast. And also uh, we've had him on uh, at the water school before, um, has, has built on, on that one. And, and yeah, we've put together using some of that Martian terrain. But we, we digress here from uh, planet Earth. Um, Chris, anything yeah. else you wanted to ask about some of these other major publications that we see here that really compile um the uh yeah a database basically of, of big floods well yeah i mean one of the things that i'm really interested in jim is is that um y your interest in paleo floods um and natural dams spans a wide range of types of natural dams i assume um i saw a list earlier where uh, you're looking, you've looked at, and correct me if I'm wrong, anything from beaver dams all the way up to glacial dams. Uh, what are some of the, you know, some of the natural dam types that create these large floods that you've uh, researched? It's been interesting. And a lot of this has come out from just a, a wide variety of projects I've worked on. But one of the first ones I worked on for the U.S. Geological Survey, these floods and debris flows that were derived from the failure of moraine dams. And the moraine is mm. is, is debris that's left behind um, by a glacier. Over the last 150 years, glaciers have been retreating globally. And sometimes, in many places, these lakes have formed between the terminus of the glacier and the moraine that the glacier had deposited when it was more advanced. So working on these moraine dams got me interested in other types of natural dams. I had worked on ice dams before, you know, the glacial lake Missoula floods, but then just starting to think about natural dams more broadly and the hazards they pose. There are quite a few, but the most important ones are, are landslide dams that come into a valley, mm -hmm. off the valley, a lake accumulates behind it, and then breaches that unengineered dam to, you know, cause floods downstream. There's ice dams. Um, beaver dams have failed. You know, those don't generally produce huge floods. And in some situations, other types of, of natural basins, geologic basins, you know, tectonic basins, like you see in the basin and range country during wetter periods, they fill with water and the water overtops the basin rim and can, can cause a, a flood downstream. And that was that type of situation was the source of the Bonneville flood. And then on other planets, craters, like on Mars, many of the large floods have resulted from the breaching of meteor impact, impact craters. Mm. On Earth, volcanic craters and calderas can also be a source of floods as well. So it's just, there's a whole range of settings and processes that can trigger these outbursts floods you know after working on a few of these types it seemed worthwhile to me to start trying to synthesize the various types of floods that can be produced you know what are their sources what are their short and long-term effects what controls their their peak discharges 
uh, what controls how those peak discharges may change downstream as they interact with the channel and valley bottom. Hmm. It's just the whole, you know, the whole thing kind of mushroomed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'd say. laughs> so Jim, there are a lot of geologic features around where we live in the Northwest that were created by the Missoula floods. And it was a mystery for a long time. You know, what created these features then got pieced together. Are there any other mysteries that you're solving right now regarding other floods, things that are, are on the horizon that we might hear about? That's a good question. Well, we're still working on the Missoula floods, for yeah, example. Still There's more a lot about yeah. those we don't know about. So the leading edge of research now on some of these large floods is trying to understand sort of the interaction of the flood hydraulics with the patterns and processes of erosion and deposition more quantitatively than it's done in the past. And so the type of modeling that you're doing, Chris, the two-dimensional flow modeling, that type of information is being coupled with ideas and theories about the mechanics of stream bed erosion and deposition to better understand the processes of erosion and deposition. So that's one cutting edge Another really important line of research right now is related to what folks call hazard cascades, where some sort of triggering event can cascade downstream to create you know, pretty significant cat catastrophes. And this is something that's mm -hmm. a primary focus in the in alpine areas where deglaciation has created marine dam lakes or ice dam lakes that have failed and have caused catastrophic floods downstream, and especially in areas that are more heavily populated than, say, the alpine areas of, of North America, where you have lots of hydropower operations and villages and and people living in these alpine valleys. It's it's a major focus of trying of research now, trying to understand how to prevent such hazards that are really intrinsically related to outburst floods and sort of adjacent processes. Mm, interesting. So I know we're short on time here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this paper we're looking at right here, Jim? Uh, you mentioned earlier, this is, I think this is the one you said was very seminal in your work and very important, kind of led everything off. What was so important about this one? You know, this, this came out in 2002 and up to that time I had worked on quite a few different projects of, you know, different types of floods, you know, uh, meteorological floods, outburst floods from rain lakes, outburst floods from ice dam lakes. But this paper was one in which I really tried to sort of synthesize how floods happen, and not just outburst floods, but also meteorological floods. And, and I look back at the suite of publications, this one really was kind of the source in many ways. Both, both of the USGS circulars um, that you have available there came directly from that paper. And then some of the syntheses on outburst floods that have been published in the last few years really have their roots in, in the compilation that went into that paper. It's an obscure paper in some ways. It's tucked away in an edited volume, but <laughs> at least from my perspective, it was it was one that really forced me to sort of synthesize my, my thinking um, around floods of, of all different types. All right. Well, we're going to pull them all out of obscurity here. If there are any that have fallen back into obscurity, <laughs> you'll have six or eight, uh, everybody attending this, you'll have six or eight papers here uh, that uh, Jim has been involved in that you can download, read on your own. This is fascinating stuff. And I hope as you read these and see the slides from today and the other presenters that as you're looking around, you'll see the signs and it's, it'll be fascinating to see where some of these events might have occurred. And maybe you'll see some things that you wouldn't have noticed before just driving along the highway. From both of you, just any final closing remarks uh, for, for today? I guess, uh, Chris, over to you first, any final remarks from you and anything that you wanted to, any last questions you wanted to ask Jim? Well, I love hydraulic modeling. I love modeling large floods. It's a challenge to me. And Jim, your work was an inspiration, uh, as was others in me setting up this model. So I appreciate all the work you've done and can't wait to see what else is coming so I can keep playing around with this thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, Chris. I guess the only th other thing I would say, if people read these papers or they want to ask questions or interact with me, please feel free to, to reach out. Happy to talk floods with anybody who 
who would like to that's a that's a big offer because we've got a lot of people attending these who are going to be interested in this <laughs> subject so you may be busy uh with some of that, eye on that inbox. going forward yeah <laughs> Well, th thanks so much, Jim. Uh, thanks, Chris, for uh, helping to field the questions. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for the work that you've done. It has really been uh, a phenomenal resource for the industry.